Good day. My name is Michelle Lavander, and I'm the director of the USC Center for Health Journalism and the editor in chief of centerforhealthjournalism.org. Thanks for joining us today for our Health Matters webinar, What Comes After Roe v. Wade? The leak to Politico of a draft Supreme Court decision has struck like a thunderbolt, even as it confirmed what many have expected. The court is poised to overturn the landmark Roe v. Wade decision. That 1973 ruling held that the US Constitution protects the right to have an abortion. Numerous laws in states across the country have chiseled away abortion protections, but the fundamental guarantees that abortion is legal has stood for nearly half a century. Today, we'll explore the dramatically changing legal landscape and the potential far-reaching consequences for people's health. The leaked opinion was a draft, and the final opinion may look very different. Nonetheless, lawmakers, governors, and abortion activists on both sides of the issue are gearing up for the end of Roe. I'm pleased to introduce you to three distinguished panelists who will help us explore this complex and fraught topic. Dr. Rebecca Fenton is a pediatrician and adolescent medicine specialist in training. She's completing her fellowship at Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago, and her work is focused on making healthcare more accessible for marginalized youth populations with a focus on the experiences of black youth. She also participates in advocacy about cultural humility, health equity, and patient doctor communication. Shafali Luthra is the health reporter of the 19th, covering the intersection of gender and healthcare. Prior to joining the 19th, she was a correspondent at Kaiser Health News, where she spent six years covering national healthcare and policy. Her work has appeared in the Washington Post, CNN Health, and NPR. And Elizabeth Nash is the Interim Associate Director of State Issues in the Guttmacher Institute's Washington, D.C. office. She coordinates the efforts of the state team, which analyzes legislative, regulatory, and judicial actions on reproductive health issues and develops Guttmacher's monthly state laws and policy series. You can tweet about today's webinar at the hashtag abortion ban, and that was one word. This webinar is made possible thanks to the generous support of the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation, the Commonwealth Fund, and individual supporters like you. We'll be archiving this conversation later today at centerforhealthjournalism.org. A word about our format today, we'll be hearing from our speakers first, and then we'll turn it over to our audience for questions. Feel free to share general comments and questions in the Q&A panel. You can also write us there if you're experiencing technical problems. Before we get underway with a virtual room filled with so many journalists, I wanna mention that the Center for Health Journalism is currently in the final call for applications for our July National Fellowship, which provides training grants of up to 10,000 and mentoring for journalists with projects on children, youth, and families. And uh, our core focus on the program is health equity. If you want to learn more, you can email us at editor at centerforhealthjournalism.org or look at the information that we'll put in the chat. Now let's get underway. Elizabeth, let's start out with you. Perhaps you could walk us through the legal landscape. You are doing a lot of tracking and you, your Guttmacher has said that 26 states are certain or likely to ban abortion without Roe. And your organization has posted a map that walks us through some different scenarios. Maybe you could take us through that. Sure. So, you know, if you want to go see the map, it's at states.gumacher.org. But, you know, what? let's sort of start at the beginning. Right now, you know, most states have limits on abortion that are generally around viability. And then you have a, most of the states in the middle of the country and the South have limits on abortion that are about 22 weeks. Now, of course, this has changed a little bit more in recent months because the Texas six-week abortion ban went into effect in September and Oklahoma's six-week abortion ban went into effect last week. So, you know, so really the landscape's already beginning to shift. Now, if Roe is overturned, right, if this draft opinion holds, we do expect that 26 states are certain or likely to ban abortion. And by that, we mean basically the states in the Plains, the Midwest and the South will try to implement pre-row bans, trigger bans, um, bans that have been adopted in the past couple of years that are total bans or early bans. And so this collection of states is really 
a large swath of the country, right? Moving basically all the way from Georgia to Montana, um, from North Dakota to Texas. And already, you know, and when we're thinking about these bans, we're thinking that they would go into effect very quickly if Roe is overturned, right? 13 states have trigger bans, and mo most of them will go into effect in a few days after the decision. Some of them would go into effect up to 30 days later. So, and if we're thinking 26 states ban abortion, that affects 36 million women of reproductive age. They will live in a state without abortion access. And what that means for the clinic network um, will basically, it will be devastating. It will be very hard to um, ensure access for everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth. And as, as we're in this kind of framing moment at the beginning of our webinar, I wanna to turn to Rebecca and ask you to talk a little bit more about um, another part of this conversation, which is about emergency contraception. And opponents of abortion rights say that emergency contraception and certain forms of birth control, such as IUDs, act as abortion-causing medications. And we're hearing about state bans that would be triggered by the end of Roe and that could render these forms of contraception legal. Could you give us a primer on how emergency contraceptives work, how IUDs work, and, and, and how that, that's awakening a conversation around abortion. Absolutely. So yes, that concern is very real. And I certainly have already seen some laws suggesting that they will not only limit um, abortion, but also access to IUDs and Plan B because of that false belief. And so I'm very happy to be the physician here that's saying that those medications are absolutely not terminating abortions and have significant benefit beyond their pregnancy prevention impact. So um, emergency contraception can include pills such as Plan B. There's also the prescription Ella, as well as actually now both forms of IUDs. For the longest time, it was the copper IUD, but we now learn that hormonal IUD can also be used for contraception. All of those generally are used within five days of unprotected sex. Um, some of them have, and particularly as a plan B pill, best used within three days with a waning effect after that point up to five days. And generally the two things that they're doing is actually delaying ovulation or if ovulation has already occurred, which is the release of an egg, then preventing the matching of that sperm to an egg. So that combination with any form of emergency contraception has not yet occurred after a embryo is implanted into the uterus. There is no form of birth control that can stop the pregnancy from developing. Thank you so much. And um, I, I wanted to turn for a moment to Shafila. Uh, historically, lawmakers curtailing abortion rights have been reluctant to punish pregnant people and focus instead on providers. How uh, might that landscape shift? And, and, and what, are, what are you reporting on in that regard? This, I think, is just such a pivotal moment because you're absolutely right. Lawmakers have been really nervous about criminalizing pregnant people, right? It's just politically so unpopular. And this week, I and so many reporters have been watching Louisiana, right? Because tomorrow, and I see Elizabeth nodding because we talk about this all the time, but tomorrow the state house is, is set to vote on a bill that would equate abortion with homicide, right? And that would criminalize the pregnant person as well. And this is just sort of like a Rubicon moment that I really want us to sit with because if this passes the house and then passes the state Senate and becomes law, it could really sort of open a floodgates, right? It could encourage more states that have so far been nervous about taking this approach to move in the direction of criminalizing pregnant folks as well. That has implications for folks who might wanna self-manage, implications for folks who might wanna travel for an abortion. And what it does is it creates what's also really interesting, this potential schism in the anti-abortion movement as well, right? Because they have been really nervous for a long time about criminalizing pregnant people. It's just it's not popular in the way that other abortion bans are maybe more politically sellable. And there's a real sort of moment of dissonance that we should all as journalists keep watching. How will the anti-abortion movement approach this moment? And will the, the side that wants to criminalize pregnancy or pregnancy loss in particular, are they the ones who will succeed or, or will it be the other side? Thank you, Shafali. And I'm gonna turn back to Rebecca and um, ask you, to weigh in on the question about um, something that you think about a lot, which is the equity implications of the end of Roe and uh, you know, how this is gonna impact in particular black and brown people, as well as the adolescents that you're serving who, uh, if it's burdensome for a, an adult to get an abortion in a state with restrictions, you know, what, what does it mean for a teenager? 
Absolutely. And first, as I was hearing she probably talk about the fact that criminalizing pregnant people, I think the reality is we have not seen that across everybody, but we actually have seen that particularly towards poor Black women and actually criminalizing their choices to have children because of the perceptions of them being welfare dependent um, and a basically like a burden to society. So the reality is that precedent, unfortunately, has been set. And just I think that's kind of where this comes and this concerns that even if these laws are technically for everybody, how much more are they going to be impacting the people who don't have the ability? Ability to travel to another state, don't have the funds or the awareness of recognizing where they can access resources. And that's certainly going to be those who are in the, in the most isolated and disadvantaged communities, including black, black and brown people, as well as our conversations in equity should also include the fact that not every, I think often we um, consider abortion rights as synonymous with women's rights. And the reality is that not everybody who's a woman is affected directly by pregnancy. And similarly, there are people who don't identify as women who pregnancy is an issue for, including like trans and non-binary um, patients as well. And so making sure that of course we're including them in this and so that we're, they're getting the access that they need as well especially given the added stigma that they may even experience coming into these clinics when they're being presented as women's health when they don't actually identify with that background so adolescents in particular um, there's always these challenges around is there a trusted adult ideally within their family that they could be able to access care from i do appreciate that in our state of illinois now it's as of july 2022 we're removing even the parental notification so adolescents in our state are able to access um, abortion without parental consent, but somebody in that household, a parent has to be notified right now within 24 hours that an abortion has occurred. And that will be something that's going away this summer as a way of being able to protect that right. And yet that's not the case for many states around us, even in our current legal environment where abortion is legal. And so there is a concern that will they have the same resources to be able to go out of stage, the funds to be able to get a service if there's not even anybody within their family who feels like a safe person to be able to support them in accessing that care. So very concerned for how this is going to impact those adolescents and all this states we just mentioned. And Rebecca, thinking about adolescence, and I know you're working in a relatively progressive state, but do, do you feel like this shift in the legal uh, landscape also has implications around just at an individual level, the kind of stigma that say a teenager might feel um, in, in, in uh, learning that they're pregnant, um, you know, I don't know, maybe even in Illinois, but also just especially in the states that are imposing all these new restrictions? Yeah, I think this would be a good time to mention the fact that we kind of talk about these early bans, and I essentially see them as bans just because of the fact of how few people are even aware and have decided by six weeks what they want to do with the pregnancy. So one in three pregnancies are actually identified at six weeks or later, and that number actually increases for people who are 15 and 19, where two out of three of them are actually identifying a pregnancy after that point. I've even had patients who are on a form of contraception, one that was not necessarily a, you know super reliable as far as it being a long acting form, who it actually took even past that point for them to even discover that they're pregnant because they weren't really experiencing the symptoms of that and even having periods because of the birth control that they were on. So I think as we talk about um, identification of those things and even just the stigma around it, that it can be really challenging to be able to make these decisions and that this idea of early giving people an opportunity really doesn't exist. And when I think about stigma, I immediately remember the rotation that I had in medical school where I had an opportunity to work with a family planning team and got to see both in office and in the operating room procedures that were for abortion. And specifically one of the patients woke up from their procedure and immediately started crying. And their first words were, everybody's gonna know. And that is still stuck with me now, like five plus years later, that there was not any immediate regret, but that this was a decision that they ultimately decided to make. I didn't know the circumstances of it, but their first thought was the judgment and shame that they were going to experience from other people. And this was even in a state where this was legal and a choice that they had access to. So, and as an adult, so how much more as a young person when um, you feel like you can't talk about these conversations with other people or in a state where your legislator is essentially telling you that this is not your right to be able to make will you experience that shame and have that reinforced by the people around you who should be that support system during what could be a challenging experience just because it's not an easy decision and sometimes it is but for often for people it's not an easy decision to be able to make and making sure that we're not adding any stress or um, harm in that process thank you so much and and speaking about um you know who is part of a support network and and just the forces pushing and tugging either way we're seeing some really interesting developments in states like California and Washington and Oregon, and their response to the likely end of Roe has been to strengthen abortion rights and prepare for an influx of patients from across state lines. Elizabeth, um, maybe you could walk us through that and as well as the, the adequacy of those kind of measures in addressing the needs, the cost issues, and just the sheer logistics for, for women in states where, where they're going to be seeing some pretty severe restrictions. 
Yeah, so, you know, really, since the Supreme Court started to become more conservative, started to shift, about three years ago, we really started to see those progressive states kind of step in and step up. And so as of right now, we have 16 states and DC that are have statutory protections for abortion rights. And that's really sort of like the basis for additional policies and programs that actually help people access care because sort of having a right only means anything if you can get, get, get to the abortion clinic and pay for your abortion, right? So, you know, so this year, what we've been seeing, you know, obviously, as you know, we've seen the Supreme Court allow the Texas six week ban to go into effect and take up the Mississippi case, these progressive states have been taking actions of their own. So sort of one of the, the biggest steps that we have seen so far is really Oregon. Oregon allocated $15 million dollars for abortion services and infrastructure. And now we are seeing similar bills pending in California, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and New York. But the other kinds of steps that states have been taking have been some of the things we've seen for the past couple of years. Um, things like expanding the provider pool for abortion provision. So allowing clinicians like physician assistants, advanced practice nurses, certified nurse midwives to provide abortion. So Delaware's governor just signed their law allowing this, Maryland signed a law earlier this year, allowing this, Washington codified their practice this year. And then we're also seeing some steps around um, abortion coverage in health plans. So Maryland um, adopted a law that allows, that requires abortion coverage in health plans. And California boosted their law by ensuring that abortion coverage is provided without cost sharing. So. And then Maine actually had just adopted some more protections for abortion clinics because actually one of the things we are seeing is there's increased presence of protesters at abortion clinics. So the safety of patients and providers is really paramount. So Maine has been you know, stepping into that part of it. And we've also seen some efforts around sort of the more legal aspects, right? You know, you're watching Connecticut adopt um, a new law really around protecting providers and patients, um, even reaching so far as to um, protect them for actions in other states. And we've seen some similar legislation introduced in New Jersey and New York. Um, but that actually, but those kinds of efforts are actually not the majority of what we're seeing. Majority of what we're seeing is really around two things, to ensure capacity, right? Expand the provider pool, work with abortion clinics, and to um, ensure people can pay for abortion. And these two pieces are key because these states that are progressive, right, tend to be along the West Coast, um, the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic, with a sprinkling in the middle, places like Illinois, um, Colorado, come to mind immediately, New Mexico. And um, so, they need to adopt these protections and put in place these programs. But um, so they're expecting so many people to come from out of state, right? If we think 26 states are banning abortion and 36 million women of reproductive age live in those states. And of course, um, you know, as Dr. Fenton was pointing out, not everyone who needs an abortion is a, a, identifies as a woman. So that number is actually higher. Um, you know, as these states though are expecting an influx of patients, we need to make sure that we have the capacity um, to provide them the care that they need. Thank you. And Shafali, you've written about some of these issues and um, how well equipped, um, how, 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 how much these state efforts can really meet this need. Maybe you could talk us through what you see as some of the forward-looking stories that would touch upon that. Yeah, I think this is sort of one of the most important topics to be thinking about from, from all states, right, is what legislation over the next two years will look like. And in blue states in particular, we have seen the provider network, even just in the past eight months, be stretched really thin, right? Clinicians in Colorado and New Mexico just say that they don't have the staff to meet all the patients who have been coming to them from Texas. And now they'll have Oklahoma. Soon they'll have all these other states traveling to them as well. So I would watch really closely, right? These funds that we're seeing passed, 
where are they going? How are clinics being supported? Are more staff being hired, right? This is a really tough time to be hiring and right, providing abortion is a job that often brings stigma and threats of violence. And so how are clinics prepared to meet this need? What are the state laws that are being put in place actually doing? I remember reading a really great story from Kaiser Health News a few weeks ago that looked at doctors in California trying to get certified to prescribe medication and abortion in red states and then not being able to because of all the red tape that came up. So keeping an eye on things like that, right? What are the possibilities for telemedicine in other states? Where is this money that we're talking about going? Is it enough? Are states like Illinois, Colorado, New Mexico that are going to be really important centers for abortion passing similar laws to what we're seeing in California and Connecticut? Those are just a few things I'd be thinking about. Thank you. And a question for all of you, as we think about patients who are low income in more uh, in states, more restrictive states, they are probably also more likely to not have a regular source of care and perhaps just to have less financial resources to to tackle this um, when they when they finally do realize that they're pregnant. So how I, I just wonder from each of your kind of perspectives, um, Elizabeth, you from a kind of legal policy framework, Shafali, when you think about storytelling, and Rebecca, when you think about the patients that you know and just trying to think through um, all that, I mean, there, there might very well be people in Chicago, for example, who are struggling with this, even though they're in a, a state that has, you know, very liberal uh, rules here. So I don't know if each of you want to just weigh in on this. Tirfali, should we start with you and just talk sure, about, about, about yeah. how you're thinking about this from the storytelling standpoint? Yeah, and I've spent a good amount of time these past two years now in abortion clinics, right? And I think that's one of the state, the places that any journalist covering this should be trying to, to go. And when you talk to patients there, I mean, ask them what it took to get there, right? Where did the money come from? How much did it cost? Did they have to take time off work? Did they have childcare? Where are the savings coming from, right? To pay for, for travel, for the cost of an abortion, for maybe any housing they might need. One woman I met in Texas told me she took money out of her savings for her home, right? And then you go a step beyond the clinic, right? If, if you live in a state like Texas, for instance, right, where abortion is very likely to soon be banned entirely, there's a real possibility that clinics there might turn into sort of support centers where they talk to patients. You can talk to the staff there. You can go there and see if you're finding patients who are learning about, right, whether abortion for traveling is even an option for them. And then a step further that I think one should consider is trying to learn more about sort of avenues for self-managed abortion, right? Which is what we're expecting to see a real increase in whether that is folks using non-effective means or trying to access medication abortion pills, right? And that's something we are imagining will fall more toward people who, who are unable to travel for care. So monitoring if that increases and what that looks like and who are the folks accessing any of these kinds of services is just one way into the story. Thank you. And Elizabeth, did you did you want to weigh in? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, you know, you know, where I've been thinking is, you know, where do states go from here? Right? Because so many states have these bans, they're going to try to implement these bans and sort of what comes next. Um, and so thinking about the legislatures and you know what they're up to, um, you know, they may be up to trying to cut off the organizations that are supporting patients, right? You know, how are they gonna to try to limit those organizations through policies and limit their reach, limit um, how they can operate, limit perhaps even, you know, because they're supporting abortion, which is then, you know, which is illegal in the state. So, so what, and so how does that affect patients access to care if those organizations um, are not as, you know, don't have as far a reach as they do right now. And then thinking more about, you know, what does it mean to criminalize pregnancy, particularly pregnancy loss, um, and thinking how far states are going to go down this road, because, you know, we've already seen over the past several decades, you know, the fight around substance use and pregnancy and how states have treated people as criminals instead of providing them with health care. Uh, so, I think that you know there are some real scary things that could be happening in um, state legislatures around all of this. And Rebecca, as your standpoint from a pediatrician, what, what can you share with us? 
Sure. So I guess I think about access kind of from the community side. And so certainly, hopefully everybody here is aware of crisis pregnancy centers, which present themselves as a place for help. Like, for example, if you search like I'm pregnant, likely the first ad you're going to see is a place that's kind of like a woman's health center or something like that. And yet when a person goes in being told that they're going to get confidential care, being counseled about their options, that they're actually given misinformation, told that abortions may increase their risk of breast cancer, all things that are not true, in addition to receiving false information about pregnancy and usually forced to do an ultrasound and are geared um, away from clinics. And so that reality is true across the country. There's actually over 2,500 of these centers in um, the US. And yet, at least um, as of 2017, which may be less than it, there are 800 abortion clinics. So just realizing when we think about information positive to negative and manipulating, we're at a four to one ratio currently. And the other thing that I think about is the abortion funds, which I appreciate in response to kind of the last week's news, um, how much they've received increased funding. The Chicago Abortion Fund is one of the oldest and actually was created in 1985. So this need for additional services, as we've talked about, like child care, transportation, and launching has existed for some time. In Illinois, at least, um, Medicaid covers abortion costs, but often patients with private insurance don't necessarily um, are able to access that because of high deductibles or high copays. And so the abortion fund actually mentions that most of the people reaching out to them, at least in Illinois, are privately insured. And also important to acknowledge that often people already have children. And so child care being a huge part of these decisions, as well as their ability to be able to access those services. And so a key thing is making sure that patients have that awareness. I know also Chicago has just put away, I think, um, half of a million dollars similar to provide these services. And going back to Shafali's point, be it helpful to see, do they actually go to those in need, especially because um, if all of the States around Illinois end up um, banning abortion. I think the estimates have been anywhere from 9 million people may have Illinois be the closest state for them to be able to access services. And that's still those 18 to 49, so not even including adolescents. And so that they're anticipating about three to 6,000 more people per month coming to access services in Illinois, making sure that we're not just uh, meeting that need on the clinical side, but also making that accessible for those for low income backgrounds or other aspects of marginalization that may limit their opportunities. And Rebecca, you touched upon the issue of people getting misinformation in these pregnancy crisis centers. And as we're talking about resources, especially as uh, options for women are likely to be curtailed, one resource is information and, and you know one possibility is misinformation. And this is something that you've thought about. Where are you seeing this play out in, you know, everywhere from um, social media to, um, you know, I don't know, some sorts of uh, messaging and billboards or so on targeting certain communities be interested in your perspective on that. At so many places, I think one of the more amusing TikTok myths I've heard is that there's like a little kind of preservation tablet inside a pregnancy test. And there was this trend on TikTok saying, oh my gosh, it's plan B and that you just can open up your pregnancy um, test and take plan B, which not only does not make any sense biologically, but it also is completely inaccurate. So as a pediatrician, I purposely scroll through TikTok just to see what are the things that my teen patients are hearing. I also appreciate that there are some wonderful gynecologists providing accurate information and responding to these myths. Um, but it's super helpful for me to always have that context to see what they've heard about or bringing into the room. So I think we do not give adequate sex ed that's culturally inclusive or even LGBTQ inclusive for all young people and sometimes even banning it from them. And even there's less states that require it that actually require to be medically accurate. And that always blows my mind of like, why are you teaching if it's not accurate? So young people are certainly looking for information online. Some of those are great resources and some of them are not. And everybody needs an opportunity to be able to learn how to decipher between those two things. There's also definitely targeted messaging towards particularly marginalized communities. There's plenty of um, kind of the Christian black circles, this idea that abortion is genocide of the black community and that we're limiting our opportunities because of those efforts. And often I actually just yesterday driving through a um, brown neighborhood within um, Chicago saw kind of one of those signs that reminded me of when heartbeats start as a way of really kind of shaming the people in that area for the decisions that they're making. And yet I don't see those same messages in the white neighborhoods within Chicago. And we also think about um, the kind of messaging and access across the country, religious institutions get to do what they want to do. And so even when abortion is legal, they don't necessarily have the requirement to mention that. I actually was interviewing for a job at a Christian health center, which is in a very impoverished um, suburb of Chicago, where they really are the only health center in town and very few people from that neighborhood have access to leave it. And yet they get to pretend like, oh, if we don't, don't mention to them, they know their options, they can go elsewhere. And so when I directly ask, like, do you mention abortion as an option for somebody with a pregnancy? They do not. And similarly, I asked, well, what are the range of birth control that you're offering? And they mentioned some of their providers provide none, some provide some, and for some reason, nobody does IUDs in that clinic. And again, I kind of going back to those points around this false information around that being an abortion um, means, and yet 
even in Illinois, where we have all these protections for the people in that neighborhood, their access is significantly limited. And so another example I can think of from a religious institution was there was somebody who actually was having a threatened abortion. So essentially a miscarriage that was incomplete. And it's actually a medical emergency if that uh, miscarriage is not completed because those retained tissues can actually cause an infection. And yet that individual in that institution was not given the medications that they need for that um, miscarriage to be completed and actually did develop an infection, thankfully lived. But I think especially we realize that treatment for miscarriages and abortion are very similar and there's often an issue around that confusion and we're even seeing now in Texas that people with miscarriages are being denied the medications that they need to be able to treat themselves because of the concern that oh that's the abortion pill. Thank you so much and one of the things we've touched upon um, as we talk about logistics and what's involved to have an abortion is child care which is a little counterintuitive to our expectations and so I don't know um, who could best answer this, but just this idea of do, what data do we have on who is seeking an abortion, like the, the profiles of, of some of the some of the people who who are who are seeking an abortion. I don't know if that's uh, whose ballywick that falls into. Elizabeth, is that something that you're keeping data on or? Um, yeah. I mean, you know, we do a patient survey and so I can provide some national um, numbers and I would love to hear what Dr. Fenton has to say perhaps about um, the patients, patients that she sees, if that matches up kind of with what I'm saying. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, first of all, abortion is one of the most common services provided, as we used to say, to women um, for reproductive health care. Um, one in four women um, uh, will have an abortion in their lifetime. So extremely common, right? There are about 862,000 abortions at the last time we did a survey. And about 50% are in their 20s. So certainly there are patients younger and older, but about half are in um, And half have, um, some kind of, have had some college or they have an associate's degree. So, but really, you know, when we start thinking about it, 75% are low income. Uh, you know, 60% have a child, have had a child. Um, and then as Dr. Fenton was pointing out, right, um, black and brown populations are disproportionately represented. Um, you know, at, at the time of this survey, um, black patients were 29% of all abortions. Latina patients were 25% and Asian Pacific Islanders represented 7%. So higher, you know, than you would expect just based on the population of the United States. Um, and so, yeah, pretty much that is sort of the, what we see when we um, interview abortion patients nationally. Thank you. And Rebecca, did you want to add to that at all? Yeah, so just in my clinic practice, I'm seeing predominantly adolescents age kind of 12 to 25. And so I certainly I'm seeing pregnancies at younger ages than kind of what we're seeing on the national side, but certainly like coming into clinic wondering, like basically nobody in the population that I've seen is planning on that pregnancy. We may have been having conversations about contraception. They hadn't made a decision yet and then end up finding themselves pregnant or we're on a form of contraception that then failed. And so it's often a conversation of like, okay, what do we do now when this was not a part of your plan? And so certainly wanting to make sure that we are counseling them on all of those options. But yes, on the larger scale, we certainly, it's not this narrative of, oh, people just don't understand what parenting is. It's often because they understand what parenting is and the expense and investment emotionally, financially, and all of those things that that requires that they're making these decisions that I cannot be a parent for another child at this time. Thank you. And Shafali, how much are you slicing and dicing this data as you think about how you profile this issue and how you chronicle it? So I look at the Guttmacher website like every day. I think it is one of the best resources that any journalist who's covering this issue can have. It's just, it's wonderful. It's great. I look at the CDC data too, because it's just good to have more, more information out there. And the CDC does track a lot of abortion data. When I'm looking at a specific state, a lot of the more conservative ones do track a lot of abortion data as well, right? So you can find out more about which clinics are providing services, maybe things on age, maybe things on race, sometimes things on whether they have more children or not. And those are really helpful, right? Because they do give you a sense for, right, what, what the challenges look like on a state-to-state -state basis, who are the people who are being affected. I do think about that a lot in sort of how I approach the stories, right? I also just, I don't know, I think as reporters, there is, 
a lot of emphasis that we we place on trying to find right the perfect person to fit the narrative right so it's like oh i want someone this age and this race and they have so many kids and came from here i'm like that's bad we shouldn't do that we should just talk to people and tell their stories because that's our job and then we can add more context graphs later that highlight you know broader trends but all people's stories are really important and I think there's sometimes an element of hubris in trying to say that there is just one that's perfect. Thank you. And, and Shafali, while we're talking to you, I, I wanted to ask you, you came to this um, beat at the 19th out of being a health and health policy journalist. And there are so many ways that we can frame the story of abortion. It's such a big story. There's the legal, there's the, you know, the policy and so on. But but how how would you maybe advise us to think about this when it comes to it being a health story? And what are some of the is that political even among at, in itself? I think there are many folks who would argue that approaching this as a healthcare story is, is political, right? Because they view abortion as not a healthcare service, right? They view it as, as this moral sin. But I think it's, for me as a health reporter, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? Like medical services determine people's well-being, their physical well-being, their psychological well-being. Pregnancy is sort of a state of healthcare. Reproduction is a human medical condition. If we think more broadly, right, health healthcare agencies around the country are the ones who regulate a lot of abortion, right? Whether it is HHS, whether it is the CDC who tracks it, right? This is just so obviously within our wheelhouse. And I think about this the way I do about, about diabetes, right? If you don't get the treatment, your health could suffer, you could die. And that is how we should be framing it. And that's why just, it seems that this is the most important lens and arguably the only real way to tell this from a vantage that that is true and not sort of skewed by political rhetoric. Thank you, Shafali. And while we're talking about framing, I, I wanna to turn to you, Rebecca, and, and go um, turn from this idea about, you know, laws which are officially lay, laying down the way we should, you know, be interpreting things and enforcing them. But there's also the much more gray area of practices inside of healthcare settings and, and, and how they can affect things, uh, what kind of information or the lack of it. You touched on that a little bit with this um, Christian uh, clinic uh, where you uh, met with folks, but is there anything you, you would want to talk about ar around how the practices inside of healthcare settings are influencing how things are going to work around abortion? Yeah, so I even just thinking about how pharmacists, practitioners generally, providers um, are able to decide what care they want to provide. And so if we truly believe that this is an essential service, then I should not be able to decide that my religious beliefs are going to impact the way that I offer stuff. Like you hear as teenagers talk about being turned away from clinics that they know have a supply of plan B because the pharmacist themselves does not want to provide it. And again, there's this idea that, oh, if I don't give it to them, they can go elsewhere. And theoretically, that may be true. And realistically, it very well may not be. And so that would, it certainly needs to be important to kind of ensure that access for everybody. Thank you. And uh, I want to turn to kind of a regional issue and, and turn to you, Elizabeth. The, the Florida story, um, it's sort of uh, been talked about as an unlikely abortion mecca and what is expected to happen there and how might it impact, um, you know, more broadly the Southeast? Sure. So, yeah, Florida. Um, it's a never ending source of all sorts of things. Um, so in Florida, it may be surprising to know there are about 60 abortion clinics, right? Given sort of the politics, given you know what we've even been, been seeing this year around the 15 week abortion ban and the don't say gay bill and um, DeSantis being very closely tied essentially to Trumpism, right? You might not think that abortion is as available as it is. Um, and in fact, Florida it has been a place for a long time where patients from other states go because uh, access is so limited in states like Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, that they come to Florida. And in Florida, uh, uh, abortion is available up to 24 weeks. So right now, um, that's the state of play, um, there the 20, the 15 week ban, excuse me, the 15 week ban is scheduled to take effect on July one. We are expecting a court case, and that would probably be filed in state court rather than federal court, particularly given what is pending and before the Supreme Court. Um, but uh, just to say that we aren't sure exactly what will happen, so people are preparing for a 15 week ban, and 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 so what that would mean 
if Florida does uh, implement this 15 week ban, that it will be very hard to get an abortion after 15 weeks, um, you know, obviously in Florida and patients may have to go certainly up to Georgia where the limit is 22 weeks and there is availability there. But given that so many patients might be having to leave the state, really people might be ending up in um, as far north as Virginia and DC um, to access care after 15 weeks. And certainly this would impact care across the whole Southeast of the country because Florida has been um, a place that has, that has been um, where people go and where care has been available. And, and to, to, to sort of further add confusion to all of this is that there's, there are calls for a special session um, in the Florida legislature to adopt an earlier abortion ban should the Supreme Court overturn Roe. And of course they had one pending earlier in the legislative um, session, uh, but that was turned aside in favor of the 15 week abortion ban. And then just to put a note on it, you know, in Florida, there was a big debate around exceptions, particularly rape and incest. And just to say that rape and incest exceptions often mean we are not, if you're talking about that, that often means you're not talking about the impact of a 15 week ban or a six week ban or a total ban or a trigger ban, right? You're talking about, um, rape and incest instead of impact. And also to say that often these, these, these exceptions are not included in any of these bans. Out of the 40 bans that we're looking at from pre-row to 15 week, only seven of them have um, exceptions for rape and incest. So they're also not something that are generally included because abortion opponents see them as loopholes. And at this point, they don't see that they need the this kind of cover to say, oh, look, we're being kind of humane because we're including these kinds of exceptions. Um, and then also just to say that, you know, if you're focusing on rape and incest exceptions, you really are preferencing the reason for the abort, that those reasons for the abortion over other reasons. So anyway, thanks for letting me get that in. Thank you, Elizabeth. We're about to open this up to everyone's questions, but I wanted to just um, throw one question before I do that to um, Shafali around balance. And, and um, you know, there's so many strong and polarizing voices around this, and it's easy to forget, you know, where public opinion stands on this. And I'm wondering, how do you approach that question of that, that kind of context, but also how do you avoid stories that just devolve into a kind of a, a, a mud fight or even a, almost a false balance? How, how do you navigate all that? I think this is right, really challenging and really important. And what we try and do is be really thoughtful in our coverage, right? I personally don't have a lot of interest in interviewing right, the, the spokespeople or the talking heads who are on TV every day. That's not what readers want. That's not what our readers want. They want to hear from, from real people right, who live with these decisions on, on all sides, who have nuanced, complicated, thoughtful opinions. We want to be really clear in our journalism right, that most of the country does not support total abortion bans. And right, to, to be honest about that, because that's true. And to not say it would be misleading. We also want to be clear, right, that abortion polling is really complicated and changes a lot based on how questions are framed. But the example that I'm thinking about is we had written a story that we published this past January that was, right, including the voices of people who remembered abortions before Roe v. Wade. And it was really important to my editor and to me to make sure that this wasn't just, right, people talking about the abortions they got. So I wanted the voice of a woman who didn't support abortion. And I found one, it was this, this woman, she you know, for religious reasons did not support abortions. She was offered one when she became pregnant unintentionally and she said no, and she was really offended. And she had the child, the child grew up. And she told me her story about, about this offer, about turning it down and about how over her life, her thinking on abortion has grown as, as she has grown, right? And, she still doesn't support abortion as what she described it as a, a quote unquote means of birth control. But she said, you know, there are complications and other people's lives are different. And I acknowledge that. And that's interesting, right? We don't hear that in the news every day, but that's what readers are actually wanting to read about and wanting to hear, right? Is the, the true stories of actual people who are not molded by Washington partisanship. I think just taking that 
really human centric approach and sort of being clear eyed about the truth will allow you to circumvent the kind of boring and overplayed politicization of abortion and tell journalism that's actually worthwhile. Thank you so much. So we're going to turn now to questions from our audience. We have one from Ashley uh, Genius, who says, how will self-managed abortions be handled? How is HIPAA not challenged if providers have to report pregnancy outcomes? And any of you can answer this. I can start, and then I'd love to hear Dr. Fenton and Elizabeth's thoughts as well. Um, but what we do really know is that doctors don't have to report for self-managed abortions because when someone presents to a hospital, if they are concerned after self-managing, especially with medication, it doesn't look that different from miscarriage. And there is no reason for a doctor to say, oh, did you self-manage? And ACOG, the American College for Obstetrics and Gynecology, is actually working really hard to educate providers about just that. Because you're right, there are HIPAA concerns, but the bigger question, right, is education for doctors, because many of them are scared and confused and making sure they understand that they don't have to ask, did you self-manage? And then that doesn't even get into the question of whether to report or not. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth or Rebecca, did you wanna add anything to that? I was just gonna add that it seems like emergency medicine physicians, at least in their conversations on Twitter, are already kind of preparing for this possibility of making sure that they're competent to be able to respond to these situations, both from the language that they're using, but also medical management of things that they hadn't necessarily seen as frequently or anticipating will increase, unfortunately. And we have a question from Catherine Walsh. She said, I'd like to learn more about the policy and implications for women that travel to have an abortion, specifically the financial support for not the procedure alone, but for supportive care following an abortion, ER access if needed, lodging costs, et cetera, making sure pregnant people are supported through the full process. So I guess I will say that, um, both kind of pre like um, nonprofit funds, such as like Chicago Abortion Fund being closest to me, in addition to a lot of the city or state funds are trying to include finances for that whole range of things and not just the abortion itself, realizing that those are all a cost that the person seeking that care incurs. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing that across the country. What Dr. Fenton's talking about is happening across the country where the abortion funds that were originally set up to help with the cost of the abortion have expanded to providing all kinds of supports for patients, helping with the travel costs, helping arrange the travel, helping to find childcare. All these things um, are really being born out of love by, um, from these volunteers. Two things I would add to that, if I could, is we are hearing, right, some abortion clinics, right, are also trying to pivot toward being resource centers, especially if they are in states that will ban abortion, and thinking about ways they can help folks coordinate things like travel or housing or maybe providing vouchers for food, et cetera. The other thing that, that I think about a lot is abortion funding for funds, right, is it can be kind of volatile, right? We, we see the cycle that they, they describe as rage giving, right? Where a big ban passes and is in the headlines and funds get showered in donations from around the country and then it stops. And there was a lot of money given to funds in Texas, for instance, when the six week ban took effect and that helped many people, but there are still, right, the folks who, who didn't have groceries and who fell behind on rent because they had to travel out of state for an abortion. So thinking about sort of the, abortion funds do really important, really thorough work. And considering that they may not be equipped to sustain this long-term because it's a mammoth undertaking for right small private organizations. Thank you. We have a question from Christine Rowe. She says, Shafali, you mentioned that reporters should visit abortion clinics to speak with patients. Do you just walk in or arrange media visits with the clinics ahead of time? And are patients generally willing to speak with reporters and clinics? So I would approach this the way I would approach visiting anywhere, which is like, be a thoughtful, considerate person, call the clinic first. Um, I usually give them some chance to get to know me over the phone because a lot of them have had bad experiences with press, right? And they should know first like that you are going to, to be fair and thoughtful in your coverage. So I do pre-interviews. I arrange a time with them that works for them. I clarify with them that, that if possible, I would love to be there on a day where they're actually doing abortions, right? Because that's not every day for a lot of these clinics, it's a lot of work. 
And when I do get there, it really varies from clinic to clinic. Some of them will want like every person on staff to sign a form before they talk to you. And others will say, go ahead, talk to anyone you like. With patients, I, I think it really varies from clinic to clinic. I try and be really gentle and considerate and say, hey, I'm a reporter, I'm working on the story. Here is a link to my outlet. If you like, um, would you feel comfortable talking to me? And here, take some time to think about it. I'll be around for a few hours. If you first feel no and then change your mind, let me know. If you just don't want to, that's also fine. Um, I usually clear with my editors in advance that anonymity should be an option of some sort, whether it's withholding a last name, using a middle name, using a pseudonym, because these are not public citizens, right? They, they are private people. They are doing something really vulnerable and abortion stigma is really, really pervasive. And that often does really help. The other thing that I found really effective is some clinics will, if you talk to them in advance about this, print out a little blurb from you with your information and contact info, and they'll leave it around the clinics. And I've had patients email me a week later saying, I saw the note in the clinic and I'd love to talk to you. Basically, be kind, be thoughtful, um, be thorough. Yeah. Thank you. I would add the one thing is, yeah, don't approach a clinic cold um, because there's harassment and violence um, in the clinics and people have done, have pretended to be all sorts of kinds of people just to gain entry into clinics. So know that, you know, the providers and staff uh, might be a little wary because if they don't know you, they don't know you and um, they have to protect themselves. Um, There's a question from Kelsey Reichman who asks, can you share any insight on the surveillance that would be used to enforce anti-abortion laws that we could see in the post-Roe landscape? Well, that's a million dollar question. Um, if I'm, I may go ahead, does anyone else wanna go? Okay. Go for it, Elizabeth. Okay, um, so, you know, I think what we've seen already, right, we have seen people be arrested and convicted for self-managing an abortion. And oftentimes this, you know, this is that someone has been turned in by someone. Um, I think, you know, what um, was being, what was being discussed, what Shafali was talking about with educating providers so that they know um, not they don't have to report and how to approach this is going to be key, um, you know. Because right now we have um, you know local prosecutors, we have policymakers who are very you know keen on finding ways to enforce these bans. Um, and I would say you know right now we even have some states that have banned the mailing of abortion pills. So there are lots of different ways potentially that states might start to try to enforce bans and restrictions. Thank you. And um, comment here from Catherine Walsh, who says, I'd like to drop a note as a public health expert that when we discuss health equity, we need to expand beyond the, the data around age and race, tell the story in regards to food deserts, health access deserts, to Rebecca's point, organizational biases regarding health access, community support services, and so on. Yes. Age and race are important features, but the information is more helpful when we can understand the contextual features of a community we are assessing. Just uh, very interesting. And, and um, Shafali, I know you and I spoke earlier about one of the next and sort of looming issues for you and your beat is health equity. How, how do you think about this in light of what Catherine is sharing? I think those are really important points. What I would add in there, I was thinking as, as you read that was gender identity and sexual orientation, um, parenthood status, all of these things that we talk about, right? The idea that there is a real question, right? About who is most marginalized by, right? Abortion restrictions and people who, right? Who are not women and who need abortions will face incredible stigma and already face stigma in so many aspects of our laws and our country. That is something that I think we should all be thinking about as journalists and thinking about right how we consider socioeconomic status in particular is something I want to spend time on because we know the folks who travel for care will also be the ones who have money and the ones who, who are trying to self-manage through, in some cases, very safe and effective means, and in other cases not, will be the ones who don't. 
I also just wanted to add reproductive justice is always how I frame conversations about reproductive rights, abortion included in that. Um, a quick definition that I really like from Sister Song is that it's the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy and then kind of three pillars of having children, not having children, and the right to parent that child in a safe and sustainable community. And I think that last one involves literally everything from police brutality to food access. Um, and so just the realization as we're talking about these things, and I think that's why we're trying to move away from this idea of pro-life and pro-choice, is that really often for certain communities that are marginalized, those choices are also very limited. And so as we talk about people thinking about all that they need to be able to care for that child, if they don't have access to those resources, they may feel more forced to realize that they can't have a child that they otherwise would love to have if they actually had all of the um, things accessible to them to be able to do so. And so certainly we have a lot more work to do even beyond this to make sure that all of those rights are protected for all groups. Thank you. We have a question from Michelle Merrill who says, is there any health data related to abortion, for example, when abortion was needed to complete a miscarriage or address life-threatening pregnancy conditions? We have some data. So full disclosure, my computer imploded, so I can't look up the information on health conditions. But yes, there is some information around sort of that aspect of abortion services. Um, there, I don't think there's any data around um, the miscarriage part of that question though. And I'm happy to like send over information if you wanna share it with folks. My apologies for my um, temperament computer. Elizabeth, if I can ask you a question, would hospitals versus clinics as site of abortion offer some level of proxy or no? Probably not because typically hospitals are, prov are providing about 3% of all abortions. Um, and yes, they're probably providing some in emergency situations, but I know of several hospital institutions that are actually abortion providers. They were set up through, you know, to provide the training, you know, and, and that sort of thing. So I think that skews the numbers a bit. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you for thinking of that. And I'm seeing a lot of questions here that really get at this question of how far, how far can this expected legal decision take us in terms of other arenas? So for example, Joyce Frieden says, will DNCs for incomplete miscarriage be considered abortions for purposes of abortionist homicide bills? And we also have questions about for people who are trying to get pregnant using assisted reproductive technology like freezing and storing embryos and prenatal genetic testing. Um, I don't know um, who might wanna tackle this, but just maybe um, because there's a number of questions sprinkled here, where can this go beyond what we think of as, can you have an abortion or not? Well, um, you know, I think there are real questions about some of the infertility treatment. Um, you know, as I understand it, um, selective reduction has become sort of less of a, less, is not used as often as it was, but selective reduction could be affected by abortion bans, as well as potentially frozen embryos. Um, it depends a little bit on how on how the state bans abortion, what the definitions are, right? Sort of that detail piece of policy, as well as how the state actually defines pregnancy and personhood and fetal homicide. So there's a lot that kind of goes into that. And then I think simply the fact that Alito draft decision says that the you know, underpinnings of Roe, the foundation of Roe is weak calls into question whether, you know, other rights are at stake, particularly around contraceptive access, um, as well as LGBTQ um, rights. Thank you. We have another question. This one's from Georgina Cowden, who says, how does insurance figure into this issue? Private insurance companies and Medicaid for those that cover the procedure in states that may not allow it, should Roe be overturned? Will insurance cover it in other states and will Medicaid cover it in you know, some states and not, not others and are insurance companies lobbying on any particular side of the issue? I can start, um, which is that right now, 
if Medicaid covers an abortion at all, it is because it's in a blue state that has specifically put money toward doing so. So there really is not going to be much of a Medicaid conflict right in states that ban abortion because it's already not covered there. Um, we haven't heard much from insurance on like large employers, right, in terms of whether they are lobbying. We've heard, you know, some folks talk about offering as employers specific abortion benefits. But I think that's a good question. What we do know, right, is that the folks who get abortions for the most part are already paying out of pocket. Um, the ACA plans don't cover abortion either. That was a big sticking point when the law was passed. And what all that means is just that that would be a really, really interesting story. But I think what the reality is, which is in some ways also interesting is that the divide in terms of income has already existed in terms of who can access an abortion and it will just grow bigger. And just to follow up on that, could the Biden administration and you know, conversely Trump or whatever, could they have made a decision to make this an essential benefit or was that decision already made you know, when the ACA was implemented, for example? My memory, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that abortion was explicitly excluded. It could not have been an essential benefit. The, the way the, um, the, the ACA was written, as, as I remember it too, because right now we're talking almost a decade ago, um, it was really about contraceptives. And then there was the provision that uh, they didn't include abortion. And then there was a provision in there that actually encouraged states to uh, ban or restrict abortion coverage in their uh, marketplaces plans. And so half the states took them up on that option. Um, and then we have another 11 states that ban abortion coverage in private health plans. And then we have 34 states that basically ban abortion in Medicaid. So fi finding out one, if your health co plan covers abortion is already difficult. And people are often very hesitant to even do that because they're worried that their employer will find out and they might be um, penalized for, for using their health coverage for an abortion. So there are lots of reasons people pay for out of pocket. Some of it is really about privacy and some of it's about navigating a healthcare system. And some of it's what Dr. Fenton was talking about, high deductibles and, you know, not me, you know, and why would you do that? And just when you could just pay for the abortion and have your privacy. Um, quickly, because we have other questions here and we're kind of running out of time. We're going to, uh, our, our speakers have um, volunteered to stay a little bit later, but I just want to make sure I understood what you were saying. Um, you're saying the Obama administration actually advocated that there's restrictions on abortion. I, I wasn't sure if I understood what you no, said. No, it was added into the law by abortion opponents. I see. Uh, uh, you know, there are, there, I mean, it was a very big bill, right? But abortion was this, I mean, like if you remember all the debate around it, around the bill, you kind of thought it was an abortion bill rather than a healthcare bill because everything was about like the Nelson Amendment. <laughs> okay, got it. Uh, we have a question from Laura Lopez Gonzalez and she asks, is there any indication of what overturning Roe and the shift in the US means for global foreign assistance and the gag rule? I do think we should be really clear, right, that at least right now, overturning Roe doesn't ban abortion. It just means that individual states can. So there's no reason, right, for the White House and its with its current occupant, right, to change policy on the gag rule. Looking ahead, right, I mean, we can almost certainly expect that a Republican occupant will reverse policy on the gag rule and will remove the funding, right, for abortions. Um, I think the question becomes more interesting if we do see a federal abortion ban gain traction or if we see the Supreme Court weigh in further on whether abortions at all are constitutional, which sounds crazy, but nothing is impossible. I'm going to um, do something that I hope the uh, people who ask these questions will forgive me for um, just because of our limited time and kind of combine two questions here. Uh, Kareem Alston says, how can folks in philanthropy and nonprofits help when it comes to communicating equitably about reproductive justice and rights? And a kind of complimentary question comes from Nicole uh, Ramirez, who says, is there any information on how social support systems, including foster care organizations, are preparing for the likely fall of Roe? Anybody? We could have all of you probably weigh in on this. The latter one sounds like a great story someone should report. Um, 
I would read that. I wish I had thought of it before so that you didn't already have that idea, but <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, this is an incredibly underfunded system already, right? The, the demand on foster care is really, really heavy. And what does preparation look like? What are the resources? How thin are they right now? Will they get thinner? Yeah, if you report that, I will read it. <laughs> yeah, I can say what I've heard from state advocates who support abortion rights have been talking about um, in, their, in their states is basically that there is no preparation for anything happening um, on, to strengthen social safety nets, whether it's the foster care system, the education system, the healthcare system, um, and that's a real problem. And Rebecca, did you want to close us out here with your thoughts on this? Sure, yeah, to the first question, I was going to say that I think going back to it's helpful to yes, no, who is accessing abortions, who has limited access, and more important, as um, Jafali has mentioned, to prevent, uh, to include context. I think as we think about context, that's how we equitably talk about these without necessarily promoting stigma by saying these are the people accessing services, but asking the question, why is this in a way abortion is often a safety net for the lack of access of contraception? And so certainly the limiting of that even only leads people needing to this option. And so being able to really think about what people have access to, how others limited structurally rather than the individual experience with only trying to make the best of the limited circumstances that they may have been placed in. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Shifali and Elizabeth for all of these really uh, wonderful insights and context and ideas. Um, I wanna thank our audience too for their excellent questions and, um, and thank everyone for their participation. And um, we will be archiving this webinar later today and we'll be sending you a quick questionnaire. Please fill it out on whether you, uh, what you liked about this webinar and what topics you'd be interested in us uh, exploring in the future. And should you want to explore this webinar and others like it, here's the information on how to do so. Thank you so much for joining us.